Describe, I mean, you're talking about the biggest emergency in the U.N.'s history, uh, this crisis, the worst since World War II, as the U.N. is describing it right now. Do you see this as a proxy war? And between what countries and for what, Patrick? Oh, it is clearly a proxy war. I mean, this may have started off as a popular up uprising in Syria, but by now it has four or five different conflicts wrapped into one. That And you have an opposition, but an opposition which is fragmented and really proxies for foreign powers, uh, notably Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey plays a role. What has changed recently, since midsummer, is that Saudi Arabia is becoming the main financier for the rebel military groups inside uh, Syria. Gatter is playing a lesser role. Um, and to, so the Saudis are trying to develop a uh, Sunni Islamic force that is against uh, the Assad government in Damascus, but is also against al Qaeda. But this is, even so, very much a sectarian force, which is already being blamed for uh, sectarian attacks on uh, Christians and Druze and Alawites. Th then, of course, you also have the United States and Britain and France, a recent defector from the, the Free Syrian Army, um, who joined the al-Qaeda-affiliated Islamic State of uh, Iraq and uh, the Levant, uh, said he was continually attending a meetings—I don't know, he didn't say where, but probably in Turkey—in which always representatives of foreign intelligence services turned up, and at one moment were being presided over by the uh, Saudi deputy defense minister. Well, Patrick Coburn, could you explain what exactly happened to the Syrian National uh, Coalition and the Free Syrian Army, the main opposition group that the U.S. and Britain and other countries uh, in the West were, were backing and, and hoping would be a legitimate uh, replacement, possibly in the future, to the Assad regime? Yeah, there was always an element of pretense in this. Uh, pretending that the Free Syrian Army and uh, the Syrian National Coalition were represented uh, Syrians inside the country. It was always very much an outside uh, exile development. Um, and, um, you know, they've never really controlled much on the ground. And what they did control is now very little. That's, you know, the, the headquarters was overrun by the Islamic Front which is a sort of combination of uh, Sunni groups, uh, appears to be backed by Saudi Arabia. Um, so, uh, basically, it's been a disaster. So, these, these so-called sort of moderate elements uh, don't have never had much influence inside Syria and now seem to be sort of almost completely uh, marginalized. And the significance of Idris leaving, uh, going over the border into Turkey. Talk about who he is and his role. Well, he's the general, the former general, uh, who was, you know, I used to watch him and wonder how did he have my, so much time to appear on CNN and so many other programs abroad. It didn't leave him much time to uh, direct uh, military action. But I think it did reflect the, the fact that he was very much um, a figure who it was useful for Western governments and Western media to promote as the leader of the uh, revolt in Syria. But he was always uh, pretty isolated, though he got a lot of believers outside the country. Uh, now he seems to be on the run, really, between Turkey and, and Gatter. But there was always, I mean, it's, it's really pretenses being exposed about these movements and individuals not being representative of the opposition within Syria, and that opposition being far more uh, sectarian, close to al Qaeda, uh, than foreign governments were prepared to admit, or foreign media was prepared to admit, a, even a year ago. The Reporters Without Borders, uh, who just released, uh, has just revealed that at least 10 journalists and 35 citizen journalists have been killed in Syria in 2013. The group said 49 journalists were abducted in Syria, more than the rest of the world combined. In a statement, Reporters Without Borders said, quote, 2013 was a turning point because jihadi groups began kidnapping and murdering 
murdering journalists in the so-called liberated zones for the first time since the start of the uprising in 2011. Patrick Coburn, could you talk about the dangers that journalists confront in Syria, and who is behind uh, the increasing strength of these jihadi groups in Syria? Yeah, it, it, I mean, over the last year, I'd put it even earlier, it's been getting more and more dangerous, I think, sort of, uh, in fact, uh, uh, almost impossible these days for foreign journalists to visit rebel-held areas. Some have been picked up, you know, just when they cross the border. Also very threatening is the fact that some who thought they had protection from local rebel commanders have found that when they come to a checkpoint controlled by the jihadis, by um, the Islamic State of Iraq or some, and uh, the Levant or somebody like that, that it isn't just they who get kidnapped, but the, uh, some uh, Free Syrian Army commander with them and his men also get kidnapped. So the, the old protectors can't protect themselves and certainly can't protect foreign journalists. Why does it happen? Well, people are after ransom. I mean, a lot of these groups, you know, are under these different rubrics of Free Syrian Army or maybe Islamic Front or different, are really sort of uh, part-time bandits. Some would say whole-time bandits. Uh, they change their colors depending on who's supplying them with money. Uh, they're prepared to uh, claim a strong religious belief or the opposite depending on where they can uh, get supplies. But all of these, one of the, the factors that's happening has been the criminalization of the military forces of the uh, Syrian opposition. And foreign journalists are the victims, Syrian journalists are the victims, and ordinary Syrians are the victims. In some senses, foreign journalists are now in, uh, having the same uh, dangers inflicted on them that apply for anybody within the within the rebel areas. Uh, last month, Secretary of State John Kerry held talks in Saudi Arabia with King Abdullah. The meeting came amidst reported tensions between the two sides over Syria, Iran and the Israel-Palestine peace talks. At a news conference, Kerry said the United States and Saudi Arabia were in agreement. There is no difference about our mutually agreed-upon objective in Syria. As I have said many times before, Assad has lost all legitimacy, and Assad must go. Nothing that we are doing with respect to this negotiation will alter or upset or get in the way of the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia and the relationship in this region. Uh, Patrick Coburn, you've also written about the differences, the growing differences between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And you have a piece headlined, Mass Murder in the Middle East is Funded by Our Friends, the Saudis. Can you elaborate on this? Sure. I find it—you know, it is one of the most extraordinary aspects of uh, the turmoil in the Middle East, that uh, the Saudi backing for— uh, extreme Sunni organizations, for jihadi organizations, um, isn't uh, opposed by the U.S. more vigorously. If you look at the official 9-11 Commission report, it said the main backers for Saudi for al-Qaeda are private Saudi donors and uh, donors in the, uh, the other Gulf states, the Sunni Gulf states. Um, Wikipedia released a memorandum from Hillary Clinton. I think, in the uh, end of 2009, many years later. Wikileaks. And what Wikileaks. does it say? Exactly the same thing. The main backers for uh, al-Qaeda and type organizations of uh, Sunni organized fanatical jihadi groups is Saudi private donors in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. Uh, and, you, you know, at the moment in Syria, Syria has taken over the funding of militant military groups who, in their own programs, say, we are Sunni groups. They don't deny their sectarianism. Uh, they, um, they only seem to differ from al-Qaeda in that uh, al-Qaeda is independent and, uh, of Saudi Arabia, and these people are dependent on Saudi Arabia. So I think that there's a whole series of Frankenstein monsters, both in Syria and in northern Iraq, that have been created and supported and aided 
by private citizens and at times the state in Saudi Arabia, but the U.S. has refused to do anything about this. It really is absurd to focus on tiny al-Qaeda groups in the hill villages of Yemen without looking at these very dangerous developments in northern Iraq and uh, eastern and northern Syria, where al-Qaeda and its affiliates, for the first time, control a great swathe of territory, really from the, the upper reaches of the Tigris River to the coast of the Mediterranean. This is a very big area. Uh, you know, it's an extraordinary development. Saudi Arabia has played a key role in this development, but there's been very little reaction in the U.S. or Western Europe or from these many um, uh, security agencies that are meant to be uh, focusing on al-Qaeda. Uh, Patrick Coburn, I'd just like to say that the, the statement by Hillary Clinton was, was released by, by WikiLeaks uh, and not Wikipedia. I wanted to ask you, though, why you think the U.S. has been relatively silent Sorry, on, uh, yeah. on Saudi's good. role, on Saudi Arabia's role. One of the things that you point out is that these Sunni jihadist groups principally target Shias, uh, not only in uh, Iraq, but also in Pakistan and in Syria. And that may, in some sense, account for U.S. silence. Could you talk about some of the other reasons? Yeah, I think that that's uh, one of the main reasons. And many of these killings of Shia get very little publicity. And then Saudi Arabia has, through a distribution of uh, uh, arms contracts through its uh, money, uh, sort of made itself part of the international establishment in which normally foreign leaders visiting Saudi Arabia uh, are—don't bring up these uh, delicate topics um, and put very little pressure on the Saudis to do anything about it. But, uh, you know, it is one of the—it enables the Saudis to really go on supporting jihadi organizations at the state or private level, in the same way that they were doing in Afghanistan, post-Afghanistan, when they uh, supported the Taliban uh, before 9-11, after 9-11, um, during Iraq, after Iraq. There seems no end to it. But it's, it's, it is rather astonishing that there isn't less reaction from governments and the media in uh, the U.S. and Western Europe. Well, what about that? The issue of the media in the United States and how it covers Saudi Arabia. Yeah, well, much of the time it doesn't really cover Saudi Arabia, uh, and it's usually rather sort of uh, delicate coverage. Of course, the Saudis don't make it easy for a journalist to have access. Um, but many of the uh, uh, facts about uh, Saudi Arabia's relationship uh, to al Qaeda and to uh, uh, Sunni uh, jihadi organizations uh, don't require any investigation. I mean, <laughs> you know, they're admitted, they're, uh, um, uh, they're in plain view, um, and uh, still nothing is done about it. You know, these are sort of attacks on uh, drone attacks or other attacks in northern Waziristan against al Qaeda, in um, Yemen, in Somalia, are really peripheral to the main problem, which is centered in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And the outcome of this support for these extreme organizations is to be seen in northern Iraq, uh, western Iraq, which is now substantially under the control of al-Qaeda-linked organizations, and uh, across the border in Syria, right the way from uh, um, the, along the Euphrates River, uh, right to, uh, to Aleppo and to the Mediterranean coast. Uh, so, you know, it is extraordinary that al-Qaeda has been the great sort of winner uh, of the uh, conflict over the last, uh, whenever it is, since 9-11. And they've managed to make tr such tremendous gains without much opposition from Washington or London or Paris.